obviously, Stefan's invited me here, um, and I will just let you know, I run a company called Tree Surgeon Insurance, and guess what we do? We insure tree surgeons. So obviously, we're not here to talk about, give you the hard sell today, obviously we do want your business potentially, but even as much as more about informative, and maybe one day you'll come across our website. So, obviously insurance is one of the, probably the most boring or unexciting parts of any business, right? But it's equally as much as probably the most important thing as well. So I appreciate you being here and in time a lot of you guys will be self-employed, you set up your own businesses and some of you guys will become employees. Has anybody done any work so far? Employed, self-employed? Self-employed, self okay, so you've already touched being out there. And most guys, I think it's fair to say, if you are successful, if you're successful, it's like you need to come see earplugs, that's what one of you do. Um, most guys, if they, they become employed at some point, if they're successful, they want to start their own business. So it's important that if it's not useful, this information for you today or tomorrow, it might be three or four years' time. Equally as much, it's very important because if you're working for somebody, all right, you need to know what insurance they should have, which is really important, what the law says, all right, and what sort of protection you've got, because there's a lot of rubbish out there. Okay? And I think it's fair to say most people have probably heard of public liability insurance, is that correct? And who's going to be brave enough to tell us what that is then? The gentleman who was here last year, who, who, who name is? Finn. Finn. Yeah. Finn, what's public liability insurance then? Is it where you, if you've been damaged to a building or something? Absolutely. It's Absolutely. It's always good when you think about remembering things, it's always to visualise it. So public liability insurance is if you damage somebody else's property effectively. It's called third party, alright? So, um, yes, if you put a tree through somebody's greenhouse, into a car, alright, that type of thing. So that's public liability insurance, and most people have, have heard of it. So we have public liability insurance, although there's little chance of me doing any damage. In reality, I can leave the gate open and, and livestock could disappear. So even somebody in a low risk occupation like we've got, we can still cause damage. Right? So that's really important. So public liability is the damage you might do to third parties, okay, which is normally going to be customers. Um, sometimes um, it could be the, the public as well. Everybody got that? Any questions at all? Good. Well, that's nice and easy, that one. Alright, so the next type of insurance um, that will be important to look at is the one where the most confusion comes up, and that's employer's liability insurance. Okay, now, Employers liability insurance, you've been here before, so I'm not going to ask you. Anybody else guess what employers liability insurance is going to be? Any brave souls? You at the back. Insuring people that work for you. Okay. It's so pretty damn. If they have an accident, they can claim against you and you better have to pay for your own Okay. This guy, where have you read that? You never know, read it last year. Okay, yeah, probably that is it. Broadly that is, but the, the employer's liability insurance is one of these things that every, there's a lot of confusion on, okay? Um, because it's what denotes an employee, okay? Which is quite obvious, so for example, this say Stefan works for college, it's quite obvious he's an employee, right? Charlie works for me, it's quite obvious he's an employee. I deduct his tax and salary, um, but not his tax, his tax and national insurance, Okay, so I'm clearly the employer. But also the thing is there's subcontractors. The term subcontractors is a very loose word. Right? But subcontractors who work under your control, or you work for somebody under their control, um, also count as employees for insurance purposes. So let me explain what I mean by that. Is if you've got a subcontractor like a groundsman, okay, or you guys are a groundsman, and effectively somebody saying you're telling somebody what to do or you're being told what to do the guy telling you what to do is giving you orders you're subordinate to him you've created a master and a servant relationship as such they're going to be responsible for your health and safety right? therefore it's a criminal offence with a fine of up to two and a half thousand pounds per day not to have employers liability insurance 
Now the important thing here is a lot of people say, bollocks, you don't need that, they're self-employed. That's rubbish. Okay? You don't need employees' liability insurance, they've got their own insurance. It's a bit like this, for example. I will use Charlie at the back then, Chuck, as an example. If you've got a tree search, and the big test is this, Charlie, if it's your job, are you going to be in charge of it? Yes. Okay, if you're in charge of your job, are you going to be in charge of your subcontractors? Yes. Okay, if you're in charge of your subcontractors, can you see you're going to be responsible for their health and safety? Yeah, I can see that, yeah. Okay, now if you're responsible for their health and safety, then the law states clearly you need to have employer's liability insurance. Alright? So the question is, if you're in charge of your job, you're going to be in charge of your subcontractors, as a rule. And this is where the confusion goes, because there are two types of subcontractors. There are what's called labour owning subcontractors, alright, and bona fide subcontractors. And this is where the confusion goes, comes. And strangely enough, labour only subcontractors doesn't mean labour only. Right? Employer's liability insurance doesn't mean you've got to be an employer, okay? It means you're a lead contractor. It should really be called that. And labour only subcontractors is the term that's used to denote somebody who supplies mainly labour and you are uh, he's been told to do it, what to do. So let me give you an example of what's called a bona fide subcontractor. A bona fide subcontractor would typically be if you were a tree surgeon and you wanted to get a stump removed. Alright, you would go along, you know, not just a little one that can be ground out, a massive oak tree that was, you know, protruding out, and you thought, well, the best thing to do here is, is get a big JCB, dig the butter out. So you get your friend down, Mickey the JCB. Mickey the JCB says, right, I will do that for 500 pounds. Okay? Now, um, First of all, Mickey the JCB has got his own insurance because that's his speciality. But more importantly, because you don't know how to influence the job, you can't say to him, do it this way or do it that way, all right, you can't be responsible for him. And if you can't be responsible for him, all right, the important thing is it's difficult to say that you're, be, you're in charge of his health and safety. All right? So this guy with the JCB is likely to be, likely to be a um, bona fide subcontractor, and you wouldn't be required to cover him with employer's liability insurance. Okay, everybody clearish on that? So it's clear there with the guy with the JCB that you're not telling him what to do. Okay, he's done it on a, a job rate, it's not a day rate. So a labourer or a climber will be on a day rate. The guy said, I'll do it for 500 quid, that's it. Okay, you're up the other end of the field on another job, you're not telling him what to do. And therefore, you're unlikely to, to have to cover him with the employer's liability insurance. So let's take another example. We're taking about somebody who's a tree surgeon. And if you're a tree surgeon and you've got a groundsman, now you're telling me, are you going to be telling that groundsman what to do? Of course you are. You will be certain of the fact that you're in control. Right, I will pick you up at 8 o'clock. Don't be late. Don't use your mobile phone. Lunch at 12. Okay, back at one, tea at three, finish at five. These are all orders. So you're starting to exert the chain of command. All right? Now, you're exerting the chain of command, so where's it stop and finish? Well, it's always difficult that, but clearly, if you've got a groundsman and you're saying what to do, do this, do that, you're up a tree, how are you not going to be responsible for him? It's impossible. So if you guys, any of you guys are groundsmen ever for anybody, okay? And they say, somebody says to you, make sure you get your own insurance, that is bollocks. They need to have employer's liability insurance to cover you. That's the law since 1969. Right? And also, you can have your own insurance, but it's irrelevant because you're not going to be liable. If something goes wrong, it's not your responsibility, it's the lead contractor's responsibility. So this comes up time and time again with our clients, and when things go wrong, they, they, they turn around and say, well, I'm, you know, the guy I work for is trying to, trying to get me to claim my insurance. It's pointless. Then it's not going to pay out because you're not responsible. The butt stops at the main man. He who wears the trousers has the insurance. Okay? Now, the other argument, of course, you always hear is, well, um, he, the guy who works for me is more qualified for me. It's irrelevant. That's irrelevant. It's not about qualifications, all right? it's about where the butt stops. 
Now, I am actually the boss, but the most qualified person in our office is our um, finance director, a girl called Karen Vidler. She's got qualifications from here to there, loads more than me. It's irrelevant. I'm the boss, the bus, the bus stops with me. And you've always got to remember that. And the other thing we always hear is this. Oh, well, neither of us are in charge. We work together. We're kind of a, a partnership. Well, you either work as a partnership, it's registered with the Inland Revenue, or you don't. And one person will be subordinate to the other. And this is the reason why that happened. Because if you're filling a tree and it all goes wrong, whose fault is it going to be? The person who tied the rope or the person who let go of the rope? If you're digging a hole, is it the person who dug the first foot or the second foot? Okay? It's impossible to establish fame. So therefore, you're either in a partnership, okay, or you're not. The other favourite one is this, we said, well, you know, guys who work for me, these are self-employed and I'm not on site, always. And the answer is this, the chief executive of Tesco's is in charge of every bloody store and everybody who works for Tesco's. He doesn't have to be in every store, they've got 500 stores, got 1,000 stores, okay? He who's in charge is in charge. Whether you're on site or not, you're in charge. And that's the important thing here. All right? Now, there are grey areas because people might say, well, you know, okay, my groundsman brings his own chipper. All right? Do I need to have employees liability insurance for him? Well, the answer is that's more difficult. Yes, when clearly when he's working for you as just a groundsman and he's up the tree, but if he said to you, okay, um, how much to chip all that wood? Or you said to him, how much to chip all that wood? And he said, 500 pounds. And he's getting on with it, his own back, and you're on another site. Then he, he, he may well be a bona fide subcontractor. So there are grey areas, but very, very few. And the other example is this, which is always important. So when you go and work for somebody, and some of you guys might you know, end up with successful businesses, that the captain of the ship, of a ship, is always in charge of everything. You know, the captain's in charge of cleaning, the captain's in, in charge of the engines, the captain is in charge of, of the food, the kitchens, the cleaning. All right, absolutely entertaining. At the end of the day, everything stops with the captain. All right, now, when, you, when the ships were at docks, maybe people loading things onto the ship with the bona fide subcontractors, but when that ship's at sail, at sea, he's in charge of everybody. All right, and the butt stops with him. And with businesses, it's like that. So that's public liability and employer's liability, which is the main area of confusion. We've had this guy say, well, look, okay, the guy works for me, um, and so let's say his insurance was, his public liability was 400 quid. And I said, and on the employer's liability insurance that you've got to have it is 300 pounds. So we quoted 700 pounds. And then he's really an insurance guy, and there is a few times when you don't need employer's liability insurance. And it's obviously business partnerships, because if you're actually a partnership, you're not employing each other, you're not subordinate, you're actually partners, equal partners to all. Okay? So therefore you don't need employees liability insurance. So the guy said, I know, I've read your insurance guide, okay, available free to download <laughs> on our website. I read your insurance guide um, and I'm gonna become a, I'm gonna make you my partner in my business. So I said, why would you give up half of your business for £300? Why would you possibly do that? That is the most stupid thing I've heard for a long time. You know, you're going to give up, you've told me you make 20 grand a year, right? You're going to give half of that up for 300 quid. And I said, well, I'll make give you 300 quid and I'll get half of it as well. Why would you possibly do that? We lost that case particularly, but that is how stupid people do. And they will do anything to try and avoid employer's liability insurance. All right? and if you can always go and work for somebody and, and they say they haven't got employer's liability insurance, do not work for them. Because they're cowboys, they're breaking the law, okay, and if they're breaking the law on that, what else are they doing wrong? Professional indemnity insurance. So, professional indemnity insurance, has anybody been brave enough to ask what professional indemnity insurance is? Answer the question. Give me in advice, like surveys or something. Or lectures. Exactly. So professional indemnity is giving them advice, surveys, motor inspections, or lectures. Because training is advice. Okay, so professional indemnity is a type of insurance that will actually cover you 
that if you give advice out and the advice is wrong. So what sort of advice could you um, give somebody that could be wrong? Okay, well, a typical example would be, don't worry, that tree, that willow tree will not cause any problems with the foundations of that house. Okay, six months later the house is, you know, all, you, you, you've got major problems with subsidence. So that's the sort of thing that you get. Right, so that is advice. Also, advice is like, if you say that will look beautiful, and it doesn't, that is advice. It's very difficult to sue someone, it takes somebody to court and say, I need money because they said that tree will look wonderful and it looks shitty. But at the end of the day, that is still advice. So what you've got to do to make a decision is where, whether you need the, that professional indemnity insurance, is whether you feel that you could be financially liable for what your opinion. So if you're giving a lot of advice, you need to take make serious consideration to trade into a limited company, which doesn't fall within the remit of this lecture, but you probably all puzzled with all sole traders, limited companies. A limited company can be shut down, the sole trader is you. So in many ways you can be liable for that advice until you die. So if you're giving lots of advice, you need to take professional opinions on whether you should actually be a limited company. And that's a really important factor to consider in the, uh, in the future. Now, another important type of insurance. Oh, any more questions on that at all? Are we, are we okay? Another important type of insurance is. Uh, oh, question at the back. Does it, if it's limited, does it mean you can say it's a limited company's fault and not your fault? As such, so like it's separate up from you. Okay. Well, two bits of half knowledge there, important, yeah. So, yeah, if you own a limited company, which you, then the limited company is not you. It's an, in, an entity in itself. The fact that you may own the shares is irrelevant. It's not you. So it's the limited company's responsibility and not yourself. So you can say, shut it down. Tall insurance is quite um, obvious. It's your tools, your chainsaws, your uh, ballistic nylon trousers, um, everything else, chippers. Okay, that's your tall insurance. And you have to be very careful, but most thefts can be prevented. The number one thing to deter thefts is a burglar alarm. Okay. So if you've got equipment, obviously good physical, don't leave it you know, in a sort of you know, paper, paper garage, but good physical requirements. And burglar alarm is the number one deterrent. Personal accident insurance, guys. So what's the most important tool in your business? Yeah. You. You. You're the most important tool in your business, right? But isn't it weird that people insure their chainsaws, they insure their pets, their TVs, right? Their cars, their house contents, all that stuff. But they don't insure their eyes. How weird is that? Was that a question for you? No, yeah. So they, so the thing here is they don't insure their eyes. So my view is, after your legal obligations, okay, for employer's liability, then potentially the personal accident insurance is the most important thing. Because do you know what? You can always buy a chainsaw, right? You can always buy a chainsaw, you know, but you can't buy a new eye or a new leg. You can't do it. And this is the thing: that people spend all their money on insuring. Them, uh, all their, their tools and their pets, but they won't insure themselves, which is just ridiculous. So, guys, when you come to go in, um, into business, whether you're self employed or employed, you need to look at per personal accident insurance. If you're an employed person, it, you could argue there's less of a need. Uh, if you work for a large employer, like for example a local council, you're likely to get what's called sick pay benefits, which is often three months or six months full pay. Okay? If you work for a small employer, like me for example, okay, because we've only got like 12 people and not them in yet, um, you won't get any sick pay, which means if you can't work due to ill health or an accident, you won't actually get it. And if you're self-employed, you get bugger all. So if you work for somebody as well and they've got employer's liability, you could say, well, I don't need personal accident insurance because I'm covered with my employer, because my employer's got employer's liability insurance. Which brings this whole whole bob back to employer's liability insurance. Because employer's liability insurance only pays out 
if the employer is found to be responsible. So the important thing there is you've got to see that everybody needs personal accident insurance. The other important thing is this, right? Who plays football, goes skiing, goes for beer, and goes for barbecue? Does anybody not do any of those things? Okay. Right, so the important thing is if your employer, if you injure yourself skiing and can't work for six months, is your employer going to pay you? No. If you go to a pub and hang out in the pub fight and break your jaw and can't act because you've got a brace on and can't work for four months, is your employer going to pay you? Probably not. Okay, if you, we've got, so these are the things that you get very little money from the state, remember. So this is the other reason why you need personal accident insurance, because it will replace that type of income as well. So that, that, that's the key. Even if you're doing that, then what? Yeah, we had one guy and he got broken jaw and he had to have it, um, uh, some sort of brace and um, he couldn't eat for like six months or three months without it. So he couldn't work, yeah, he got into pump fight. Yeah. The worst, we had a few gruesome claims. Yeah, you should probably, I should go outside the pubs in Hadler and sign people up, shouldn't I, in the way in. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, the, the worst claims we've had, um, we had somebody six months off of an infected testicle, they called it on a barbed wire. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and he, and he it was gruesome. Um, and, and the funniest one was this guy, well, not that it was funny particularly, but he was walking his dog, his tree surgeon, he was walking his dog and he tripped over and he fractured his coccyx, which was the bottom bone there. And he was off for months and months with it. He said he just didn't know how. He did it because he's up all day climbing, playing around with chainsaws, um, and he managed to do that. So yeah, so this is the important thing. So would you employ if your employer says it's fine, I'll pay you four wages for a year, yeah, you might not need personal accident insurance. But unless he says that, there's a damn good argument that you will need it. Now one of the other things is that I should have talked about there's two types of insurance. So there's contractual there's contractual insurance that you have to put and legal. The only insurance that you have to have by law is employer's liability insurance, okay, and actually third party vehicle insurance. The other type of insurance is contractual, where, where you required it for a contract. That's public liability insurance, all right? So for example, let's say you go and work for um, some Kent, Kent County Council or whatever, they will say you've got to have five million pounds, all right? And people say, they, they, they should, because they, they, they've got to have five million pounds worth of public liability to have the, uh, get the contract, it's a legal requirement, it's not. It's a contractual requirement to work for the council. So you always be careful with that, the legal requirement and what they require and, uh, can be two different things. Any questions? Yes? What's the best insurances to have for your son? For you? For you? Yeah. Well first of all you want to do, make sure who you're working for has got employer's liability insurance. Yeah. Okay? If they turn around and say, no get your own, tell them to go fuck himself. If they, if they have. If they have got employer's liability insurance, then what you need to have is make sure you've got personal accident insurance. Because you can still have an accident and, and they're, they're not be responsible, which is the key. Right? And what sports do you do? You don't. Okay, do you have a beer? Okay, so the issue is if you go out and about, you still need to have personal accident insurance because you don't know what can go wrong. Alright, which is the key. So for you, personal accident insurance, when you start doing your private jobs, public liability and employer's liability insurance, uh, the time being, only personal accident insurance. Okay. Do you do it cheaper if you've got tickets as well? Oh, again, that relates back to what we said earlier. Okay? Because I said to you, with Stephen, I said that insurance, they, they, you have to warrant that you're suitably qualified. That we don't ask to see your qualifications, but if you're not suitably qualified for the work you do, the insurance they can pay out. Any more questions? Do you want a quote? <laughs> How much would the quote be for personal accident? Well, what I would do on that, the best thing to do on that is actually give us a call. And the reason I say that is because your insurance is taken made to you. Okay? And you probably don't want to discuss your details with everybody else. All right? Because we might ask some health questions, you know, sexually transmitted diseases. All right? <laughs> <laughs> and you may not, and you may not want to do it. If, if I was just doing like private jobs at the weekends and stuff, so after, after I've done my tickets, yeah. <laughs> would, you, yeah. would you then say, get employers so if I get someone to come and help me? Yeah. yeah the, the thing is, it's not an option, guys, so this is it. It's not an option, it's the law. 
Because what you don't want to do, you really don't want to do, is do a weekend job, have your mate work for you, and my favourite one is this, right? My mate wouldn't sue me. He's my mate. Poke his eye out and see what happens. Right? Plus also, do you really want to start your career right, with an HSC prosecution? Right? And then tell me this, which company is A going to want to insure you if you've been prosecuted with the act by the HSC? And who is going to want to employ you when you've been prosecuted? Because it's a criminal offence, it's not a speeding offence, it's a criminal offence, the same as nicking something. Right? So your application form for your job will say, have you ever been convicted of a criminal offence? It's a crime. Back to your question was, what's the question to this? Yeah, they've got employees like that. Okay, right, so how to, okay, so this is who's the job, okay? So you can't share responsibility because the customer will know who's in charge, quite effectively. Very, unless a customer rings, first of all, all three of you at once, the reality is one of you is going to be in charge. Alright, first of all, and if three of you say none of us are in charge, well, who's going to ensure somebody's in charge and nobody's in charge? Not a good risk from the insurance point of view. Now, what you're alluding to is, hey, if one of you's got the certificate, can you all dance around it? Okay, the answer is no. For you, okay, that's the reality of it. The answer is no. Because the issue is that one of you is going to be, who's going to be responsible? Whoever's in responsible is wearing the trousers, all right, actually needs to have employees like their teachers. And that's really important. Okay, now, with business, a little bit, this is all about marketing now, you will get more business by being in charge. Okay? And if you ever say to a customer, who's in charge, and they go, well, we'll, we'll sort of share it, okay? you're not going to get the business. I'm in charge, but stops with me, I will make sure everything goes well. A, you will get more business, and B, you'll be able to charge more. All right? and secondly, if you're doing that, you're already exerting yourself to actually be in charge of the other guys. So somebody's got to wear the trousers. Okay, if not, you're doing the worst thing possible. What you're doing is you're giving insurance companies money and also saying to them, you don't have to pay out because we're breaking every, every condition. So if it's your job, you're in charge of it. Okay? If, for example, one of you's got public liability and employer's liability insurance, but so the other the orange, your name is. Tony. And Tony says, you know, my, my neighbour wants their trees done, okay, and I said I can do it for you. The answer is we're going to say is, I can do it, but I'll be doing it with my friend through his business. I'll be working for him. I'll get him down to do it. But the best thing to do is give us a call, and we'll make sure you get a great price and the right cover.